It's Song Talk Radio with Michael, Neil, Phil, and the gang. Welcome back to the show, everyone. We are so glad you could join us here on Song Talk Radio. This is a little show where we talk about songwriting. We share tips and tricks and things we figured out along the way, and you share your tips and tricks, and hopefully by the end, we will all get just a little bit better at writing songs. I'm Phil, and uh, I'll be the key host today. And along with me, as per usual, are my good friends that we talk songwriting with. Over on my left is Mr. Neil Modi. What's new with you, Mr. Neil? Oh, no, nothing much new. I'm just um, wondering why you called it a little show, because last week you told us, you told me anyway, that we were a big deal. A big deal. <laughs> big friggin' deal, I believe, is the phrase. Oh, is that not the phrase you used? Okay. That's a phrase. In, in that case, you're, you're, on, you're on. That's right. <laughs> And of course, uh, Mr. Michael Proudfoot. What's happening, Michael? Oh, I'm staying busy, staying active. Was out in public today, having a lunch, wandering around with humans, wearing a People. mask still. Oh. Yeah. I can never lead anything in good. public with humans. <laughs> it's not going to lead. No, it's, it's going to end in tears for sure. <laughs> oh, but I had a, nice, no. had a nice double beef, a beef soup and then a... Uh, a sliced beef sandwich with the fried onions on a Kaiser at uh, one of my favorite diners. Mm. Wow. So That's I, very like, good. I feel sad. Like your red meat consumption for a month. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, I've got finally I'm started to unpack my studio. So things are starting to hopefully sound better. Oh, cool. excellent. Yes. Man, mm. No more accidental reverb. Mm. Right, so we've got <laughs> now the real stuff. <laughs> yeah, the real stuff, and um, we've got some uh, some stuff happening. Um, our song talk re uh, radio challenge. It's the third one, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is our third annual, and uh, unlike the other ones, this one is different. Well, the others were different too. Uh, I think our first one was a positive, uh, positive uh, lyrics with the minor chords, and then it was repeating chord pattern. And this time, it is lyrically driven in that uh, you have to start with the title "Why Do You Cry" and write a song from that. And uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of submissions, and they're quite good. Uh, I would hope that uh, we don't get too many instrumental submissions because I don't I don't think that that's really the spirit of the thing. That's but, true. Uh, I do appreciate any submissions, but I'd like to hear what you do lyrically with a with a title mm -hmm. as well. Indeed. Um, and how's, we how's it coming along with hours. you guys? Uh, um, I'm doing okay. I actually have something, uh, which was more than I had two weeks ago. So. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your drum track. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm still right. working on it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah no, so you need uh, separate stems? I'd, I'd like I'd like your separate stems. Yeah, vocals, guitar, yeah, bass. I'll, I'll send you that maybe tomorrow, actually. Easier for me to mute stuff. Uh, but uh, I was really happy when I laid down that that first track to my mm -hmm. rough stuff. It, it synced up and made it made it work very nicely. So, right, right. so I'm feeling quite positive about it. Cool. Very nice. Some, and John how about you, Phil? From yes, uh, harmonies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Um, I didn't yeah. know I could sing that high. <laughs> <laughs> I've um, yep, I, I've got started, and uh, okay. now that my life is starting to come back to normal, I feel a bit more positive that I might be able to actually deliver something. So that's always mm -hmm. exciting. And how have you started? Because I know you're you're always a lyrics last person. So how how have you started? I'm curious. Yeah, I'm started curious with about the that. chorus. Started with the chorus, like the lyrics yeah. for the chorus. Yeah. Oh, nice. So you worked out a melody around Why Do You Cry and went from uh, there? I actually started off with some words. Cool. So. Oh, okay. Um, wow. This has a, been a good challenge for you then. It's huh? a brand new world for <laughs> You Phil haven't heard it yet. That. You haven't heard it yet. So uh, <laughs> no, but regardless of what the outcome true. is, you know, pushing you to write in a different way, I yeah. think is always a, a good thing. It is, actually. Well, well it's true. It's so easy just to do the same stuff that you've done all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yes. So uh, please uh, send your stuff into feedback at songtalk.ca and um, just a contest entry or something like that. And um, yes, we'll definitely tell us about your show. journey too. like how you like, did you start with the lyrics? So, like, tell us how you, how that song came to be as well. We really like the we like the songwriting process stories. Yeah, strangely enough. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing, because this yeah, is yeah. really a cooking podcast. That's true. <laughs> and before we get into our next recipe, we're going to be talking about something um, really uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon. Do you want to um, um, 
sort of introduce that? Or why don't we actually, we're very excited to actually have a guest to talk about this. Um, He's been on our show before, Mr. Eric Alper. And of course, he is a Canadian music correspondent, blogger, radio host, and former director of media relations at E1 Music Canada here, um, here in Toronto. Um, and since 2016, he has run a music publish, uh, public relations company, That Eric Alper, and is the host of uh, At the uh, That Eric Alper Show on Sirius XM. Thanks for being on the show again, Eric. Oh, it's I'm so happy to be here. I, I have waited so long to talk to somebody, anybody that would listen on why old Betty Crocker recipes are better than <laughs> new ones. And what I think it had to do with is the baking trays are now using better aluminum. Wait. This really isn't the cooking show. No, no, it's not the cooking show. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I, I really want to hear the end of that story. Right, right. For cooking asparagus. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, just, it's just because, you know, when your mom made food, it just tasted better. And yes, when you and, and when you cut sandwiches diagonally, it tasted better. They I don't do. care what anybody had to they say. They do. That is very true. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, happy to be here. I'm happy to be anywhere. I'm happy to, to, to talk to you guys. And uh, yeah. This is this is life slowly getting back to normal. I think for all of us, mm-hmm. Absolutely. right? So, and this is um, an interesting topic. It's um, ca- something they say about catalog music, which is outselling um, new music. Uh, Michael, do you want to uh, fill in the details a bit? Yeah, I think the first. I don't know, call it alarm bells, but the first time this was newsworthy, I think it was back in 2015. That was the first time that uh, catalog music outsold new music. And I've noticed from searching it that this happens periodically, uh, mm-hmm. but I think uh, it's not quite as cut and dried as old music. You know, people would rather listen to old music than new music. I think it has to do with a number of factors, but I am curious. Uh, is this uh, a signal of some massive change? Does this mean that people aren't interested in new music? And I thought, well, how could we figure this out? And I thought, well, our friend Eric Alper would probably know, or at least have a number of suggestions and, <laughs> and theories. <laughs> and interpretations. So, Cause the, cause so a, is, a lot, is this oh. uh, a reason to be alarmed? Um, I think if you're a new artist, yes. I think if mm. you're a new artist that's not on TikTok, doubly yes and and i think that you know it all depends on on what side of the industry that you're on you know if you are one of the dozen or so companies that have seemingly bought up every single classic song of the last 60 years to 30 years um you're really really happy with this this is why you were seeing hundreds of millions of dollars exchange hands to people like bob dylan or sting and paul simon is now right right at this moment i'm um, negotiating selling his catalog we've seen phil collins get up there in terms of wanting to sell his catalog so you know the ability for that kind of music music from say 1960 to 1990 that every generation until we all blow up to smithereens in some nuclear war are going to be listening to this music forever because all these companies want is they want their money back and they want their investment back and they want it fast. So we're going to hear Bob Dylan in television commercials. We're going to see um, sting story in Broadway and on, you know, soundtrack work so i think if you're that side of the company and you thrive on catalogs i think this is great news i think if you're a brand new artist you probably already know that nothing sticks these days it's really hard for any book any television show any movie to really land in the center of america or north america or the world in terms of everybody all consuming the same thing at the same time for a long period of time, you know, there will never be another album like Michael Jackson's Thriller or Nevermind by Nirvana. We're too scattered. And I think that these numbers that were were revealed, that catalog sales, meaning music that is m- more than two years older, are seemingly, you know, demolishing the, the newer numbers uh, in terms of new artists, in terms of new songs, I think is really scary. It, but it all depends on what side of the industry you're on. 
But so, just for uh, some, just for some. Whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> well, the questions are coming out. <laughs> I was just talking. Just, I was just talking. I don't have any idea. Come on. Okay, um, just for some background, um, mm -hmm. uh, the MRC um, uh, during across all the whole of uh, 2021. Um, Catalog music actually claimed 69.8% um, of the total album consumption in the United States. Originally, it had looked at 74.5, uh, but the numbers are a little bit different. But that's still a pretty significant uh, change. Yeah, the point is that it seems to be growing um, yeah. year after year. But I'm, I'm curious, Eric, if you have some insight into this whole 18 months equals catalog music. Mm. Like... How did like is, is that a reasonable datum line to be setting to determine what constitutes catalog music and and what doesn't? Because I mean, you know, like we're we're all old people here. You know, to us, catalog music, like you say, is Michael Jackson's Thriller. If if not, that's even you know not even catalog. Like you can go you can go beyond that. I mean, eighteen months. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, that that number was just kind of thrown out of the air by Billboard magazine. I mean, Billboard loves to work with the music industry in order to ensure that there are as many potential and possible charts for radio and singles and albums in as many different styles of music and genre in as many formats. Um, they would probably want to have, um, you know, a... a, a, a a cassette chart. Actually, today Billboard just announced that they have launched an Afro. Um, uh, it's an Afro pop chart specifically to highlight those songs in the Afro pop world. Um, so Billboard was the one to say, "Look, you know, in conjunction with the record labels who were probably complaining that the album chart, the Billboard 200 album chart, was filled with." Bob Marley, Pink Floyd, The Beatles, The Stones, The Who, Led Zeppelin, Fleetwood Mac. And it was really tough for them to develop new artists when they weren't cracking the charts. They couldn't get radio excited about these songs from these new artists. They couldn't get retail to take more copies of an album if it didn't make a chart. So Billboard and the music industry agreed that 18 months was a really good way um, to kind of come up with a number of months that maybe radio stuck these new songs into gold rotation, which is maybe they'll just bring it out once a month or so. So, you know, a song that came out in 2019, you're not going to hear it every day like you did on the hit radio station. Maybe you'll mm. hear it once a month. And so the billboard charts have to reflect that. Um, they have a catalog. Billboard also has a catalog album chart that as soon as you go after 18 months, if your album is still on the top 200, it automatically went to the catalog. But now it doesn't. So, you know, that's where you start to see, actually, if you went on the chart, you would see Pink Floyd, you know, rumors having 571 weeks. You'd have Bob Marley's legend still on the chart. Dark Side of the Moon comes on the chart every once in a while. You see Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, all these albums with 500 weeks or more. Journey's Greatest Hits is still in the top 50. So it was a way... As it should be. <laughs> well, as it should be. Um, shout out to South Detroit. Um, but what it, what it really is, Windsor. it's a way for the music industry can to continually work and justify spending money on growth of their market with new artists, always having new development, new publishing deals to be, to be had. And, you know, right now, the fact is that 200 of the most popular tracks now account for less than 5% of all the total streams that three years ago, that number was about 10, 12%. That means that even when it comes to social media and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, even if you have a really popular song that's on the Billboard Hot 100, you are probably not even scratching the surface of hitting everybody in America like you used to. And I think that's a bigger issue. I think you can take a look at these numbers and kind of play with it. But I think what it really comes down to is, does even having a hit mean what it did before? Whenever I post about Drake, having or extending his number ones on the R&B chart on Billboard or Drake having, you know, demolished the all-time Billboard Hot 100 song list, invariably I will always get a couple of dozen people on Twitter saying, 
yeah, 273 songs that made the Billboard Hot 100. I can't name any of them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a bigger issue because I think we're gro- we're we're getting to a de- we're getting to a style and a and a kind in in human existence where the really popular stuff isn't really as popular as it used to be. And I think that's going to change the way that the industry takes a look at things too. Now, I had a question from what you said earlier on, because all these companies or very few companies are buying all this music, all these catalogs, do the charts represent what people actually want to hear? Do, does radio represent what people want to hear or does it represent what these companies want to be played? I think it's, probably the latter. I mean, we've certainly seen a lot of consolidation across North America with, I mean, here in Canada with Bell, Rogers and Shaw, um, you know, consolidating as much ownership as possible. So what you hear on a pop radio station in Vancouver is exactly what you would hear in the afternoon drive in Calgary, Edmonton, Victoria, Vancouver, Toronto, Halifax, Montreal, because it's almost the same ownership. So it's kind of going, you know, you, I, I think, I think maybe the first time I was on this show all those years ago, I think we were talking about radio and I really remember saying like, we're all going to go in the way of the BBC, which is there's going to be like four different channels and that's really going to be it. There's going to be a hot AC and AC and a rock and a maybe, you know, a light AC or country and that's it. And whatever city you're in, in Canada, you're going to hear the exact same music wherever you are. There's no more localization mm-hmm. really anymore. And we've certainly seen that in the States. So what people want to hear might be completely different than what that one or two or three people are programming for the entire country. And so, you know, that's a really great question because I think it kind of falls in the same line as are people consuming and buying and listening to what they really want to hear or are they just getting it fed so much that they don't have a choice because they don't even know what else is out there. Mm-hmm. Well, and one of the issues you're faced oh, with streaming where you have to choose your own or you get suggested music. Well, you get, you get yeah, an algorithm but, choosing but, for but you, right? Right. But it's so overwhelming. I mean, I, 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 there are so many people that are older than I am that would love to go on Spotify and they almost get very scared about going on it for the first time because it's glorious to, I think the four of us to know that there's 65 million songs on Spotify, every song we can possibly ever want. I know that you three can probably come up with a couple that aren't on there, but to (laughs) your chagrin, Mm -hmm. but the ability, like what on earth do you listen to? And if you Mm -hmm. haven't bought an album, a new album since maybe you were 33 and you're 50 now what on earth do you listen to like where do you even go when most of the rock stations are playing one new song an hour mixed with the who and the cult and journey and all that stuff so i think it's not even a problem anymore it's not even an issue to me that catalog sales have taken over new stuff it just seems like this is what it is how do we all kind of work on this when you're a new artist now it's also i wonder um because everything is so fragmented, you know, at one, one time in Toronto, there was like, um, really two rock and roll stations on AM. There was like Chum, uh, the Chum and CFTR. And basically those are the two rock stations. Chum and, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and that's basically what everyone listened to. And that kind of loud, um, you know, new stuff because you'd be hearing like new songs, yeah. you know, once an hour and you would get to know them and then you'd go into a record store and all those new releases would be the first thing that you hit. Right. Right. And yeah. Now, and look, you could, is no. you could, you could call up the radio station back then and they would play something yeah. that you would want, <laughs> um, you know, and if you got a really True. crazy DJ on the air, like we had in Toronto, I mean, we were kind of blessed having a oh, lot yeah. of, a lot of really larger than life characters. They play the same song again, just because yeah. they could. Like I remember hearing like Duran Duran, like almost like they they promised and threatened a new you know a Duran Duran song every hour, and then they would just play the Reflex again to because they knew that they were the station of Duran Duran. <laughs> like you could never get that right now. They would say, but look at what, and I'm sure that you you know you guys have talked about this and, and thought about this as well. Like you know, seemingly every once a year, there's always a big story coming out of the 
incredibly low percentage of women on country music radio. Mm. Now, is it because that there's no great music that is put out by women? Of course not. So who gets to dictate that? And who's telling you that? Because if you talk to the music directors at these country music stations, they will give you research this high saying women don't want to listen to women on country radio and men sometimes don't want to listen to two more two or more women songs and then seemingly that's a horrible thing to say because on paper it sounds awful but if they can back it up with research well that's their job is to keep people listening until commercials mm -hmm. so it's it's you know you have this issue and then you have a whole bunch of other issues and you're like okay so now what do we do like do we just now you know going back to the whole if you are a publishing company or if you're a venture capitalist who happens to own a lot of a lot of older material, do you start to spend a lot of money after TikTok influencers trying to get a Buddy Holly song to go viral instead of, you know, maybe mm -hmm. the next 18 year old pop star? Like that's going to be interesting to me is how much does or when do when does the music industry in general start hitting the button on things? A couple of, I don't even know when this was, seven months ago, eight months ago, it seemed like Stan Rogers was blowing up and going viral because all of these TikTokers were singing work songs and singing sea shanties. I know what one of the labels that has a lot of those sea shanties hit the button on spending a lot of money pushing that out there. You know, once they knew it was kind of hitting on its own, they were like, well, we should capitalize on this. That money could now not be going to somebody that's new in terms of development. So I don't so know. For, for a new artist, is it all doom and gloom or is it because the industry has changed in the way that people consume music, artists have to change the way that they reach out with their... You know, yeah, with, I, their I, new, with their new songs. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there's never been an easier time to get your music heard. That's for sure. I mean, even with, you know, 10 or 15 or $20 boosting a post on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, you can reach 2000 people within your community. You can find like minded artists and their fans and go after them. In the olden days, that was next to impossible. If you didn't get your video played on much music back in the day, um, you were screwed. You couldn't, there's nothing, there's no other opportunity for you unless you decide to play the country coast to coast to coast to coast. Now, you don't even need to play live. You don't need even need to go outside of your house. You have the ability to do your song. You can do remixes. You can do collaborations. You can do the instrumental version. You can do the acapella version. You can have all sorts of different versions of that song and promote it and boost those posts to to those people that are out there without even having touched the industry, finding your own little niche. If you want to elevate that, if you want to go and find that record label or find that management company, it's never really been easier for them to pick out those artists and hopefully lessen their losses. They, The amount of data that these record labels and management companies and booking agents have right now, I mean, they can look at who is streaming more than a million songs in the city of Toronto um, in the last 48 hours that's on an independent record label and just start having their A&R department offering contracts to them. They don't have to go based on gut feeling anymore. So the old adage of, well, for every 10 releases that the major labels release, seven would lose money, two would break even, and one release would pay enough for the, all of their seven losses you could seemingly not be batting a hundred percent anymore. You could be very well be batting 700, 800% in having the market dictate where you should be spending your money. And I think that's glorious. So I think if you're a brand new artist, the tools are there for you. You just have to not really be sad that you can't just be an artist anymore. You have to be a publicist and a marketer and a booking agent and a manager and a social media marketing. Like it's, it's endless, endless job tasks, which I don't envy anybody that wants to get in this business anymore. Yeah. And being a hit doesn't probably make you as much money as it used to either. No. Um, well, it, it depends. Yes. I mean, if you're going to get a million streamed at 0 0.0043 cents and you're going to make $4,000, that's not a lot of money. 
But if I were to tell you that I can get you on a radio station that has a million listeners and you're going to make two cents off of that song, you're actually making more money streaming it. I mean, it's kind of apples and oranges because a million people are actually choosing to play your song rather than a million people listening to it by force on a radio station. So, yeah, but I think that was the dirty little secret of the music industry in general. It was not a lot of artists were making a lot of money anyway. They could certainly make enough money, I think, to survive. And by selling CDs off the stage or cassettes or merchandise playing on the weekend. Um, but there were also a lot of bands like that. At least you could have a shot. Now, I don't know. I, I, I don't know anymore. But I, I certainly don't hear the top 1% complain ever. But I never heard the top 1% complain ever anyway. I think that that's, that's just getting that, that triangle at the top of that 1%. I think the middle is getting really, really large. Mm. And that middle is very close to the barely surviving, if that part of it, you know, you, I, you, I, I, I think, I, I think there was something like 98.8% of all the music on Spotify have not been listened to more than a hundred times. And I think those numbers are pretty accurate when it comes to YouTube as well. Because after you go to your parents and your friends and your family, how on earth do you get anybody else to listen? Yeah. You well, know? This, this whole question about like, like back in the day, you just had to listen. I'm to just getting was... depressed. I'm just, I'm just leaving this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like back in the day, you had, you had like Flo saying like a choice of three radio stations and, you know, rock A, rock B or rock C. Like that was pretty much it. Now it's all splintered. But what happens the first time you go on Spotify? What, what by default, knowing that Spotify knows nothing about your listening habits, what do they feed you? Is it basically what the record labels want you to hear? Is it maybe is it what 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 happens to be top forty on the radio? Is that what they feed you? I mean, I mean, I've been using Spotify for several years now. It's really, really the algorithm knows me better, knows my music taste better than I know my music taste. Oh, we all right? know your music taste, and we're <laughs> and we're very embarrassed for you. <laughs> journey, um, journey till the end. <laughs> um, you, 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 you know what I mean? Like if if I hit the the you know the the Friday new releases, they're all artists that i follow they're all artists that i know and 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 those are those are my peeps right that, that, it's that's, amazing. that's my thing and my my daily playlist like I, I i dig those playlists because they're they're geared towards my taste and i hear new songs by new artists that 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 that, that, that i like but i just i'm curious like for someone who's not invested in that way and makes their own playlists and all that sort of stuff at least go on their spotify for the very first time and spotify knows nothing about them what do they get? Most people will just um, encounter a technology and just sort of take whatever it, it gives them. Like most mm. people don't explore technology. They wouldn't sort of, yeah. you know, and what they would probably do is actually go and listen to their old stuff. And actually the um, older generation has discovered streaming over the last year. And that's one of the reasons why the numbers have gone up. Yeah. That, maybe that, that's, that's why that's, it's yeah. skewed a little bit. But another question I'm wondering is, you know, is there going to be another Duran Duran? Is there going to be another, you know, police, a huge band that, that has that stuff that becomes catalog music? Well, is, is like, is like Drake, Adele, Taylor Swift, are they? B I, think BT I think BTS. BTS, I think BTS are, are they comparable? Are they, are they, is, that, is, that, is that the same level as Michael Jackson was in 1983? Um, maybe not the same level as Michael Jackson, but I think that they are absolutely what we would consider Duran Duran. I mean, they okay. just, they just had their, their, um, their live concert across North America being seen in movie theaters um, completely shattered the one day gross revenue for music. They had something like six and a half million dollars spent at the box office, which demolished every other music movie out there when it came to the live concert Avenue. Mm. We just may not think of that because we're not really in that world, you know? Um, but my parents didn't know about Duran Duran or Culture Club or mm. um, the Eurythmics or Soft Cell or the Police. They didn't really know that stuff. But I think what what changed though was somewhere along the line, and I think you can you can blame or thank the Walkman or the iPod or just generational. Somewhere along the line, we. Parents thought that it would be cool of them 
to send the music down to the next generation. Somewhere along the line, when I was growing up, there was no way that I would be listening to what my parents were listening to. I saw what they were listening to. My parents actually happened to be very cool, but <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. I was like, no, I don't want your Motown. I've got my, you know, like this. And so somewhere we stopped, and I hate to say it, we stopped. We Parents stopped playing their kids, Strawberry Shortcake, Sesame Street, The Wiggles, Barney, mm. all of that stuff, kids' music, and immediately turned them on to the Beach Boys, the Ramones, the Beatles, and the music that they grew up listening to. Metallica we, for four-year-olds. Metallica. Like, the biggest line is, like, it's it's mini pop kids, it's um, kids bop, it's ba uh, like the, the 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 piano music with with Metallica and Ed Sheeran. Somewhere in the last twenty twenty five years, we've kind of allowed our kids to like the same music that we do, and vice versa, because it was never cool to like your parents' music. Mm -hmm. Now you go to a Fleetwood Mac show or a pink show or a BTS show and, or Justin Bieber, there are moms that are screaming just as loud, if not louder at this guy than the, than their daughters are. So mm. I, you know, I think that there's something to be said for this generation of eight to 18 year olds, not solely thinking that it is uncool to only listen to their music, that whether it's the Batman using Nirvana songs or Marvel superhero movies having tra having um, traffic in their soundtrack. It never used to be like that. We used to watch Pretty in Pink and it would be Psychedelic Furs and mm -hmm. Talk Talk and Duran Duran and Kate Bush. And it would be only new songs. Now, mm -hmm. you, you'd be really hard-pressed to find a soundtrack First of all, you'd be really hard pressed to find a soundtrack, period. But you would be hard pressed to find a soundtrack that doesn't have some sort of nostalgia factor tied into it. Like mm. Guardians of the Galaxy, it had all totally. the It was a fabulous soundtrack. It was, totally. plot, it was <laughs> the best thing about that movie. Okay, the, okay but, but Michael. The character's mother had left him a, a cassette of 70s music, right? Mm. But but see, now, if you're, if you're having a movie, and I know we're going all over the map here. So let's say mm. that you're making the next Guardian of the, the Galaxy. What's in it for you to use nothing but 60s and 70s music? You're not selling a soundtrack anymore. You're really riding on the coattails of Fleetwood Mac and, you know, all of the songs that are being used. You know, the Batman using, using Nirvana as a really big part of the movie helps Nirvana out as much as it helps out Batman and the DC series. Cause it's got Provided that coolness they own for both. their music at this point. Like if Warner brothers makes a movie and puts right. Warner brothers music in it, right. They're the ones that are profiting from there it. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. We used to do that at, at the labels where some of the movie side, some of the movies that the company would be putting out would be really hard pressed to use music that wasn't on the label already because it would be like why 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 do we I, want universal or sony you know yeah so, years ago I, I did a pilot for a teen drama series that was being sponsored by warner brothers and the, the caveat was you can use anything from our catalog but yeah it has to all be you know, like the soundtrack has to all be warner artists yeah mm. yeah and it's also weird you, you know like i mean let's face it like your average person after the age of 35, 33, tends to not listen to that much music anymore anyway. You know, they have a they have kids, they got married, they have a mortgage, they have a job, they're taking the bus, they're taking the subway, where maybe, you know, music really isn't a factor, they're still listening to the same stuff. And especially in the last two years, where we've kind of, you know, as much as Netflix can all, always proclaim that, well, look at all of the amazing new series that are blowing up. And certainly the music industry can look at Olivia Rodrigo and the new Adele album and the new BTS and and all sorts of new Megan Thee Stallion and all these brand new artists. For the most part, I would probably think that we're just looking for comfort. You know, we're looking for music that got us through the last two two and a half years of of familiarity and comfort levels. Um, so we are going back to 
maybe Adele, but maybe we're going back to the first album. Maybe Adele sold 17 million copies of her new album, but is it really touching people like her first couple of albums did? I'm not so sure. Hmm. I guess only time will tell for that. I have a question because I thought it was interesting what you said about the generation that exists now of, of younger people were raised by their parents to listen to, you know, good music or, or at least you know, adult music as opposed to being uh, given kiddie music. So they go, oh, I, I like that Fleetwood Mac song or I like the Beatles song or the Nirvana song or whatever era of their parents' music they're into. So have they created uh, a young audience who don't care to listen to new music necessarily, whereas we all were didn't want to listen to our parents' music. We were hungry for something new. What's the new sound? But perhaps like the the audience now that should have been only listening to new music doesn't has been raised in a way that they don't necessarily need that because yeah. they have they have the catalog. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, so at their finger. Greta Van Fleet. When you can listen to Led Zeppelin, I. You know what? It, it's an excellent point. Why? Why even search out the hundred and ten new artists out there to find the one really good one when it's proven that these forty artists that are always on the Rolling Stones best vocalist or best bands or best albums of all time are already proven to you. You know, there's status there. You know, the other thing is, as well is, you know, when we were growing up, we're, we were all, you know, I, I get the feeling like we're all the same age. We're all in our in our mid thirties. Um, the <laughs> the ability to claim nostalgia and say, yeah, I listen to oldies, man, that was like 1940. 1950 yeah, Elvis was still alive when I was alive. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of knew about him, but I certainly wasn't. I was listening to some of his older stuff, but like the listening to music from 30 years ago in 1985 would be me listening to Ricky Nelson from 1955 back then. It just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Now you talk about 35 years ago. And I seemingly think 35 years ago is like, 2010 but it's not like these kids are still buying nirvana and soundgarden and everything and i think part of it is just the accessibility of it we don't have to save up 35 dollars to go buy that album and hope that mm -hmm. it's there it's right there in our fingertips and these artists are still alive they're not dying paul mccartney you want to go see paul mccartney you can see him you want to go see elton john you can see him there was nothing really cool about seeing somebody from 1950 in the 1980s now it, it kind of is and i think we've all celebrated those artists because we're still here and the generation, whatever generation you're in, always, always says that their music and their books and their film and their TV is better than anybody else's out there. Mm -hmm. Some people, have, true. I know we're definitely going to get I, I'm, saying, I'm generalizing too. I'm just <laughs> no, like, no, you're, like, you're, you're like largely my, right. Like my daughter <laughs> will always be listening for the rest of her life. She's 18. She will always have Olivia Rodrigo in her life. Always, 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 because that was the art. That's the biggest artist in her of her generation. So, will she get into the Beatles? Yeah, she's slowly getting into classic rock and stuff like that. But you know, it was it was harder than I thought. You know, I I <laughs> I, I felt like I failed a lot of times because she just wasn't getting into it, and she would be liking Bieber and Drake and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, that's okay. Eventually, she'll come over to the dark side, and slowly she is. Yeah. We will well, definitely I remember sitting be... down with my son and having explain to me this trap music. What the hell? Right, <laughs> right. We is definitely... everything built on triplets? God. <laughs> but it's also in the way that we're consuming it as well, too. You know, if you're a teenager and you're getting all your music based on TikTok, you're really only hearing thirty seconds of something, and that's not a knock yeah. against the listening devices. That's just the way that the concept of of music is used there. It's using it as in the background to creating a dance or creating a very mm. funny video. It's not looking at your older brother and sister, wondering what they're listening to, wanting to be like the cool kids, saving your money, taking a bus, going through that first section of the record store in the new release section, hoping that they have it, reading, you know, buying it, taking it home, unwrapping it, all the things that we have talked about ad nauseum about buying a vinyl record. Um, 
it it's it's the experience of it and more importantly you didn't own anything else unless you saved up enough money to buy something else so mm -hmm. you were stuck with that record and so it's not just flipping through four seconds and you've got five seconds to to win me over you know michael asks and it's such a good point you know like is it sad when you're a new artist and is it tougher? Yeah. Cause it's almost like if you don't get to the chorus in 15 seconds, you may not actually have an audience that will help get there. A lot of people will be saying, yeah. asking also whether it's the quality of the songs. People are saying that a lot of modern songs aren't terribly memorable just by the way they happen to be written, which is often by committee and, you know, sometimes, you know, almost too formulaic and, I don't know if that's true or not. It's it's you know one of those all those kids in their songs. It's not as good as. <laughs> I mean, there you know, was Tin Pan Alley. There was the Brill Building. There was you know there've been committee songwriting forever. Mm -hmm. I will tell but, you, I'll, I'll leave my own personal opinion out of it. I, I I don't. There's a lot of stuff that I love. I think Billie Eilish is great. I think Olivia Rodrigo is great. There are a lot of older artists that have told me that they're choruses that they hear on the radio today wouldn't even make it as a bridge in their song yeah wow. they they there is no way that some of the stuff that they're listening to would even make it past the committee of the brill building because it was like your verses had to be choruses your choruses had to be double choruses and your verses were likely a chorus from another song that you couldn't finish by deadline yeah you know so i i i will i will defer to them but the art of songwriting means something different to everybody in every generation in every culture well that you is know? true and i know yeah. um one of the articles that we'll link to in our show notes um talks about one of the issues uh, that a lot of companies are nervous about um listening to un, uh, demo tapes because you know they could get sued in eight years mm. so it's almost impossible to get your like new people music to be heard by people because it's so risky for the companies to actually hear new music because they have they could get sued in uh mm -hmm. eight years the blurred yeah. lines decision really changed things yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, it was, and it was also the ability that you could you can now have you know again because people can access every single song that's ever written somewhere whether through youtube or not the ability to for somebody halfway around the world with barely an internet connection can make as much noise in the media when they decide to sue Katy Perry is astounding because you would never hear about these cases 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They would all be done very, very quietly. Or that artist who thinks that their song got ripped off would, would just walk away in frustration because they would have no idea how to get a hold of Katy Perry and her people or the Blurred Lines writer or Ed Sheeran. Or it seems like every day there's a new plagiarism charge against these songs. And I don't think that they're running out of songs. I think it's just so much easier for somebody to complain and, and hear music when we all have access to every single radio station in the, on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I've been finding is that a lot of the new artists that I like and, 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 and even a lot of the new artists that are that are even big, like your Taylor Swift's and your and all the guys, they're kind of harking back to that old school music to a certain extent, you know, like they're kind of writing songs in the way that they used to. Like Billie Eilish is maybe the, the exception to the rule where she's really pushing something new and, and different and, yeah. and, and, and truly, truly modern. In, in, in that sense but a lot of the, a lot of the songs are like I'm, I'm loving the new tears for fears album like it's yeah. fantastic you know yeah. and it's like I, like a lot of the music that i like today even if they're new artists or if they're older artists coming back then it's kind of you know like like you say it's like harking back to you know when i was in my 20s 30s and it's reminding me of something back then that i think is good that's yeah. true yeah i mean do, does i mean does the does the art of of songwriting change when it is by committee because you would think and you know if you I, I think you make a blanket statement either either yeah, one I mean, or like the if other you've got eight people writing a song like wouldn't you just think is that coming from me i'm, oh, I'm hearing music no no it's <laughs> playing <laughs> out it's uh, is that, is that, it, running out of time is that the wrap-up okay yes or no wouldn't you think that if you got eight 
people writing a song, they would each come with just a bang up like eight bars, and every song would so hit, but it doesn't. No, no it doesn't. That would, seem that, that, that would be schizophrenic. <laughs> Hard to do things with committees. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. As, as a general well, rule, no, but. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, but that, that I guess, being said, like I, real build building and stuff. Like I just that. get the feeling, like we're talking to you guys with Phil and Neil and Michael, that you three are as big of a committee as you ever want in your whole life. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, just you three. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thinking we should do a show in the future, but our favorite songs written by eight people. That's true. <laughs> well, I do have a blanket statement to make, and that means the band is oh. wanting to go home <laughs> that means it's all the time we have today on song talk radio eric thank you so much for being on the show Thanks, you guys. are awesome much, eric. Is always happy to be here i'm How sorry that i didn't let, let let you guys get in a word edward uh they no. can find me at that eric alper That's the point. uh type in eric alper at google you'll find me mm -hmm. he is everywhere don't forget we want to really hear from you the listener so why don't you send us an email to feedback i don't i don't want to hear from anybody <laughs> no. i don't care what anybody else's opinion is don't <laughs> don't come at me i don't care what you have to say <laughs> go, bug, go bug neil neil wants to know where you Neil wants to do everything uh, send all your men <laughs> to ignore it all send all your complaints to neil anyways um so send us an email feedback at songtalk.ca with any questions or comments on this particular topic we'd love to hear from you your emails make us very happy. We do read everyone. And uh, don't forget, uh, you can always um, uh, join us uh, for the next Song Talk meetup. Uh, free to join on meetup.com and free to attend. So uh, stop by the website for that information. And don't forget about our next songwriting challenge. We want to hear from you. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, you better have subscribed because I know where you live. Anyways, if you want to get more uh, from Neil. At least Neil, your IP you address. That? That's true. <laughs> Neil, how do we get more of you? At neilmodi.com. And how about you, Michael? Uh, I don't have anything new, so uh, no, it, I don't want to What be have you been right doing now. during the, this whole <laughs> pandemic? Go get yourself a website. <laughs> GeoCity. <laughs> I don't have anything new either, but I got lots of catalog stuff. <laughs> uh -huh. Michael, go go to geocities.com. GeoCities. Go, 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 <laughs> Don't forget to uh, AOL.com. <laughs> my, uh, MySpace.com. MySpace, MySpace. Michael, Michael Proudfest. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could be one of his eight friends. Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to stop drinking during the show. Don't forget, you can find the links to all the products, books, and web services we mentioned here on the show on the resources page and wherever you are. Don't forget to join us on the next uh, Zoom Song Talk Meetup. Um, free to attend on meetup.com. And um, that's about all we have uh, for today. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for listening. And uh, keep on writing, everyone. So long. Good night. Nine people wrote that song. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all named Phil. They're all named yeah. Phil, and they're all inside my head. So <laughs> my, 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 my two takeaways from this episode are it, it doesn't really matter that much, and number two, follow the money. Yeah. I well, yeah. yeah. You got to figure out what, why are you writing songs, really, is the question. Are you trying to make money? Are you trying to play for people? Are you, right. Do you just like writing songs? Yeah. yeah. And... You yeah, know, for sure. Yeah, look, man, yeah. if you want to make money, do you be a lawyer, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't think anyone should get into songwriting and being a musician to make money. Yeah, no. Unless like, you want although, to be a session player. Although back in the day, I mean, if you had a really huge number one, you know, number one hit all over North America, you could make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the 70s, oh, God. You know, well, yeah. Mark and Martha are still living off Echo Beach. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, it, it, it if you sold a million copies in America, you could buy a really nice house. Yeah. Because it was just all of the auxiliary stuff. Now you hit number one and you stream a million times, you know, 
do you want to buy the large bag of potato chips or do you want to buy two small? <laughs> you know, like there's no, there's nothing exactly. in it. Do you but, want fries with them? Do you want fries <laughs> with them? <laughs> you can get, you get the big bag at Costco <laughs> right, now. Right. Do you want to supersize your meal? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's crazy. Anyway, thanks for having me guys. Um, Great to yeah. have you, right? let me know if you need Thank anything you. else. For sure. We will. Yeah, okay. We got another show coming up in a month or two that might be right up your alley. So we'll be. In okay. Touch. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. All right. We'll All talk right. soon. Have a good Great. night. Take care. Eric. Okay. Good see you. Bye. Bye.